Uh, good morning, friends. They're in Yankton, South Dakota. I am so glad to be with you. I guess we could say I'm coming to you from my room of quarantine here in Springfield, Missouri. I managed to contract COVID-19 at, at the last district council that I was at last week. And so um, to avoid infecting any of you, I'm coming to you by video this morning. And I'm so glad for the opportunity to share this Mother's Day Sunday morning with you. But before we go any farther, can I just congratulate you on the choice that you have made for your new pastors? Um, Spencer and his family are an awesome addition to any church that they are, are part of. And you will appreciate not only their leadership, but their passion for a true experience from God. So I think that you will you will appreciate that as, as we will find that really the only thing that will make a difference for our personal lives, for transformation for our families, for the community in which we live in this world we inhabit, really is an impacting, transforming experience of the power of God. So I am just pleased as punch to know that he is there with you. So before we go any farther, I do want to tell you a little bit about who I am. My name is Ruthie Obert, and I travel for the Flower Pentecostal Heritage Center in Springfield, Missouri. We are the largest repository of Pentecostal materials anywhere in the world. And as such, we have researchers that come to us literally from around the world to study in our research center and to learn more about how God has worked through his people. And I'm gonna explain a little more to you about why that's so important as we go on. And we're going to take a look at some women that God has used throughout history. And as we take a look at these women, I want it to encourage you to be thinking about the ways that God has, has worked in your life, because it is, is, is so important that we remember that God has given us the responsibility as mothers, as fathers, grandmas, grandpas, aunts, uncles, um, even just friends of the younger generation to pass on the stories of how God has worked in our lives. And so we're, we're going to go into that today. We, we've got a variety of women to look at. Some of them are single. Some of them are married. Some of them are, are mothers by birth. And some of them are mothers by, by adoption or sometimes even by accident. Um, and we're going to take a look at that because I want you to remember that um, it even though it is often said in our churches on a day like Mother's Day, that the highest calling that a woman can have is to be a wife and mother. I, I want to give that a caveat because the highest call that a woman can have is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And some women will be wives and mothers, but some won't. And that's a part of God's plan for life as well. Not everybody will be a wife and mother, but Everybody can be a disciple of Jesus. And that really is the highest call that we can take. So we're gonna go right into the things. I'm gonna hit my share screen here. So I'll have a little bit of moment where you're seeing some of the, um, the transition here. And I'll trust now that you've got me as a little bitty screen up at the top. And then we've got some great pictures of some pretty incredible women that we're going to go through. We're going to talk this morning about memorials. You know, Memorial uh, Day is coming up the end of this month. So this is an apropos time for us to talk about this. We're going to talk about how we can use the stories of Pentecostal pioneers, in this case, Pentecostal women pioneers to encourage, equip, and inspire another generation to serve God as spirit-filled believers. Because isn't that really what being a mom is all about? Encouraging, equipping, and inspiring another generation. Now, whether those are your kids, your grandkids, or somebody else's kids, we have stories of how God has worked and we need to share them. So let's move on to this. Um, in Exodus 3.15, we remember that the, the people of God, the children of Abraham, are in slavery in Egypt. And God decides to move. He says, I have heard the cry of my people and have come down to see about them. 
And he calls a man by the name of Moses to go into Egypt and set the people free. And Moses said, hey, when I go into that land, who am I going to say? Which which God? There are so many gods that we've heard about over the last 400 years of slavery. Who shall I say is sending me? And here's what God said to how he was going to identify himself to his people. He says, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, and I'm, I will say this includes the daughters, the Lord, the God of your fathers and mothers. And I want you to catch that. He introduces himself to a new generation by connecting himself to their history, to where they came from. And then he, he says, not only just your broad history, but here he gets specific. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. These are names that those people knew. They had heard the stories of their ancestors. And now out of the blue, God is identifying, he's revealing himself to them by saying, I am the God of your ancestors. Imagine if God, is, should he, if a Jesus should tarry in a hundred years, reveals himself to your great, great grandchildren by saying, I am the God of your mothers, the God of Mary, the God of Jennifer, the God of Hannah, and I have come to you. He says, this is my name forever. This is my memorial name to all generations. And so we see here that when God reveals himself to a new generation, he does it by connecting who he is to the previous people that came before them. Now I want you to see how practical God is with this idea of this memorial connection. After Moses has gone into Egypt and the people have, have come out of Egypt and they've wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, they come to a body of water. And when they get to this body of water, the Jordan River is at flood tide. And it is what is, is between them and the promises of God, the promised land. And this obstacle in front of them, well, Joshua does what he saw his leader do before him, Moses, when they were at the Red Sea. He goes to God, God tells him what to do. And just like at the Red Sea, God opens the water of the Jordan River and the people pass on dry land. But even though God often works the same way as he did previously, it's usually with a little bit of twist, isn't it? And here's something different that God did with Joshua that he did not do with Moses. Now that they're entering into the promised land where they will be living, not wandering, but living. He says, take for yourselves 12 men, and command them saying, take up for yourselves 12 stones out of the middle of the Jordan and carry them over with you and lay them down. In other words, he's gonna send 12 men back into that water that is, is currently parted. And they're going to pick up 12 big stones, bring them out to the shore and set them down in a big pile. And then he says to the sons of Israel, so here's why. When your children ask their fathers and their mothers in time to come saying, what are these stones? Because this is what kids do. They ask, why? Why is that there? What is that? Don't discourage that. That's how they learn. When they ask, what are these stones? Then you shall inform your children saying, Israel cross this Jordan on dry ground for the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed just as the Lord your God had done to the Red Sea which he dried up before us. So in other words here's what God's plan was that the moms and the dads the grandmas and the grandpas would walk with the children and they would occasionally run into these memorials that had been established. Sometimes they were altars, sometimes they were just memorials and reminders. But when they would see these, then God had set up that natural curiosity in children to ask the question, what is this? And then you say, oh, honey, let me tell you, when Grammy was a little girl, I can remember we were on the other side of the river 
and the man of God opened the waters through the power of God and we crossed on dry land and then your great great grandpa went in and got a big stone and brought it out and set it here so that today I could tell you that no matter what obstacle seems to be in front of you if you are being faithful to God and you have received his promises I want you to know that the God of your grandmother of your great grandmother of your great great grandfather has been working in your life before you were ever born and you can depend on him what a great way to pass the faith on to the next generation by sharing these stories so how do you think israel did well we find out pretty quickly the very next book the book of judges we see this report in the very beginning it says that the people serve the lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua, who had seen all the great work of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. But then Joshua, the servant of the Lord, died. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. This is how history works. One generation will pass away. One day, that name on the tombstone, the bulletin, the gathering at the church will be about you. That's how history works. All that generation were gathered to their fathers, but history doesn't stop there. There arose another generation after them. But I want you to see how the scripture writer describes this new generation. He tells us two things about them. Here are the people of God living in the land of God, the recipients of the promise of God, and yet they don't know who they are. Look what it says. There arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord. They are the people of God with his promises, and yet they don't even know who he is. But I think we're going to see some of the reason for that in the very next line. Nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. So two things this generation was ignorant of. They were ignorant of the Lord himself. Their theology was, was just either non-existent or totally out of whack, but not just their theology, their history. They didn't know the Lord, nor did they know the work which he had done for Israel. Now, how do we get to this within one, two generations of being in the promised land? Apparently, at some point, the mothers and the fathers, the grandmas and the grandpas, the aunts and the uncles, stopped walking with the children past those memorials. They stopped telling the stories of what God has done. And now we have a generation that does not know who they are. So I'm going to encourage you this morning as we tell just a few stories. I want you to think about how God has used these kinds of things in your own life. And today, while you are gathered around the table for Mother's Day, they're obligated to listen to you today. So I want you to tell some of the stories from your life to the next generation. And I'm going to tell you some of the kinds of stories that you need to be telling. Number one, we need to tell our children the stories of how God has answered prayer. You know, it's one thing to tell them God answers prayers, to write thoughts and prayers on Facebook. It's another thing to share with them the experiences of God's answers to prayer. One of the, the little ladies that I want to tell you about is, is a well-known missionary in the Assemblies of God, Lillian Trasher. I wish I had time to tell you her whole story, but I don't. We're just going to tell you one. A young single woman who felt the call of God to Africa at a time when young single women just didn't do this kind of thing. And she felt this call from God. She had experienced the power of the Holy Spirit in her life and broke off an engagement to a minister that, that was a good fit for her, but he didn't have the same call that she had. And so she got on a boat with a little bit of money that she had, and she said to the Lord, God, if I never marry or have children, I want to be obedient to what you have called me to do. When she got to Egypt, she did whatever her hand could find to do, one of which was to take care of sick people. And one day she was in a hut taking care of a woman who was dying. They, they knew that, that she was going to die and, and uh, Lillian was just providing some care for her when she heard a cry from under a little blanket um, across the room. And when she went to lift up the blanket, she discovered that under there was a little baby girl. 
And she went outside and asked the people of the village, what will happen to this baby when the mother dies? And they, they shared with her, there will be no one to take care of the baby. She'll be thrown into the Nile River. And Lillian, as this young woman who has never raised any children says, well, could she come with me? Could I care for her? And they said, fine, no problem to us. And so Lillian becomes a mother quite by accident. Pretty soon it gets around the area of Egypt that there is a lady from America who will take in children that nobody else wants. Well, she started doing this at, the, at a little past the turn of the century and turn of the 20th century. And by 1940, Lillian has over 900 children to take care of. Now, we know what's going on in the world about 1940, don't we? We've got a lot of issues going on. And Egypt in particular in World War II is a very strategic place because of that Suez Canal. And so up in the, in the northern part of Egypt, there's a lot of fighting going on. We've got a lot of, of German and Italian subs up there trying to take that Suez Canal. And so refugees are fleeing south. Lillian's home for children was about 200 miles south of, of Alexandria, Egypt, up on, the, up on the, the shoreline. And so people were coming south, and pretty soon Lillian finds not only does she have 900 children, but she adds about 100 more widows to her, to her group to take care of. <coughs> well, because of the, the embargo and things that are going on up north and the difficulty of getting things in, Lillian has been cut off from all communication from her supporters in the United States and the United Kingdom. And so she's not receiving any support, nor can she let people know of her need. And so by 1941, it has become such a serious situation that Lillian is running desperately short on food. They've done everything they can to dig up what they can to make soup out of, out of turnips and to boil and find things. But pretty soon flour, um, all of the things that you need to provide food for so many people, a thousand people. Some of us have trouble feeding our three kids. A thousand people, and Lillian is in a dire situation. The children's clothes have not been able to be, to be um, as, they've, as they've grown, as it's worn out, she's not able to replace their clothes. The linens, towels, all of the things that she needs are running just about into nothing. She realizes this on a Sunday night. And on Monday morning, when the children wake up to come into the chapel, for their morning devotions. She says, children, we need to pray. We're in a serious situation. She led the children in a prayer of, of request to God to care for them and provide for their needs. They prayed through the day <coughs> and put the children to bed Monday night. Tuesday, the children got up expecting to go to school, but Lillian kept them in the chapel and said, children, we need to pray. The situation is serious. And they began to pray. She leads them in praying the Lord's prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And Lillian stopped the children and she said, children, we need to pray that line again. Give us this day our daily bread. Pray that again, children. Give us this day our daily bread. And something broke in that prayer meeting as children with hungry little tummies began to cry out to a heavenly father to provide for them in a way that no earthly father ever had. Well, that evening, Lillian received a telegram that was quite frightening. Alexander Kirk, the U.S. ambassador sent a message to her that said, Mrs. Tra Ms. Trasher, we are in a, a desperate need in Alexandria. Could you come and see if there's any way that you would be of help to us? Lillian doesn't know what happened. She doesn't know if this, the war situation has become worse and she needs to prepare for more refugees. So she gets on the train. She makes the 200 mile trek up to Alexandria where she meets with the U.S. ambassador and he says, we have a serious situation. Greece has capitulated to the Axis powers. And because of that, there was a ship that was en route to Greece that has been ordered to turn around and return home. They have come through these waters, but because of they need to be able to maneuver around these subs, they have dumped all of their cargo on the shoreline to lighten their ship. And we are in a serious situation. We are facing possible riots as, as people find out about these crates. Is there any way that you could use 
flour, powdered milk, towels, linens, clothing. Is there any way you could help us with this? And Lillian said, my goodness, yes, I absolutely have need of that, but I've no way to get it home. And Ambassador Kirk said, the US military will provide a transport. We will take all of this down to your home. And on Saturday, <coughs> Lillian rides in the front vehicle of this military convoy with truck after truck providing the very things that the children had prayed for that week. And on Saturday night, they went to bed with their little tummies full. And on Sunday morning, they came to the chapel in their brand new clothes and thanked a father who had provided for them even before the need had become apparent. That ship had been packed with exactly what they needed months before they had ever prayed, but it showed up at just the right time and in just the right place. You know, we need to tell these kinds of stories to our children, not just encourage them to pray, but let them know of the times in your life when God has responded to your prayers, perhaps miraculously, perhaps with simply giving you the fortitude to go through a situation and then coming out of it stronger than you would have ever been before. We need these stories. Amen. Another kind of story that we need to tell are the stories of God's courageous call. I want to tell you about a, a little orphan lady by the name of Alice, Alice Wood, who is just an incredible, incredible lady. She was the first Pentecostal missionary to the nation of Argentina. And what's interesting about her was that she had always been, always, from the time she was little, a very adventurous girl. One time when she was seven years old, she reported that some of the older girls had told her that the way to conquer her fears was through an old saying was conquer a snake and you will conquer everything you undertake because Lillian had been a very fearful child. And so she heard this conquer a snake and you'll conquer everything you undertake. And so the next time she saw a snake wiggling across the road, she ran over to it Put, it, put her foot on its head and yelled at her sister to pelt it with rocks until it was dead. From childhood, she was a woman who ran toward the things that others ran away from. She would, was orphaned at age 16 and lived with a foster family. Now I want you to catch that date. That's 1886. The foster care system is not what it was today. And even, even today, it's, it's not the best that it can be. And she grew up in this and, and was pretty much given freedom to do and run what, whatever she wanted. So she began attending some churches. She attended some Methodist and holiness conventions and began to pray for the power of God in her life. At age 25, she enrolled in a Quaker training school. And they trained her for ministry because the Quakers believed that there is an inner light within each of us. And that includes if you are, are created in the image of God, as both men and women are, the Quakers trained women for ministry. And so upon graduation, Alice began pastoring a church in Beloit, Ohio. And when a young missionary visited their church, there began on a, on a, something in Alice that desired to go to preach Christ where he had never been preached before. So she resigned her church and began, became involved with a holiness organization called the Christian Missionary Alliance. Many of you have heard of them. And they sent her to Venezuela in 1898 and then on to Puerto Rico in 1902. But while she was there, um, the, the work the overwork that she had took a lot of toll on her health and she had to return to the United States. While she was on her way back, she heard of a revival that was taking place in Wales and under Evan Robert, Robertson, have you've heard of the Welsh revival. And while she did not go to Wales, when hearing about this, she knew there was something more in her life that she needed. When she arrived in the United States, and was in Philadelphia, she heard of another revival outbreak at a small African-American church in Los Angeles at 312 Azusa Street that increased her hunger. 
seeking after God. She went to a little revival being held in Ohio by someone coming out of that Azusa Street revival. And she received the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Along with this, she received a renewed call and a recommissioning of the Lord to return to South America. <coughs> when she called the Christian Missionary Alliance to let them know of, of this experience that she had had and this recommissioning that she was ready to go back to South America. They broke ties with her as they did not accept that spiritual experience, that Pentecostal experience that she had. Nonetheless, in 1910, this is before the Assemblies of God even exists, in 1910, with no commitment of support, Wood sailed for Argentina as the first Pentecostal missionary, simply trusting that God would provide. After a few years of working in the field, her health problems returned, but knowing the power of the Holy Spirit, she turned to God rather than returning to the United States to see doctors. She later wrote, this was when I learned to take Christ as my life. Jesus has healed me of cancer, of nervousness, and many other ailments, and I praise his name. When she received the, the news that in 1914, they were forming a Pentecostal organization that became to be known the Assemblies of God. She was unable to attend the meeting, but she sent a letter that said, I want to join up. And in 1914, in November at the Second General Council, November 1914, Alice Wood's name was added to those first credentialed, ordained missionaries and ministers of the Assemblies of God. Now, here's something that's interesting about Alice. She went back to Argentina in 1910, and until her retirement in 1960 at age 90, she never took a furlough. She never traveled to request money. She simply stated that God had called her to Argentina. She understood that call to be for life. And until he, he told her to leave, she wasn't moving. And I, I love this particular story. When she was 88, um, a national worker sent a message to the Assemblies of God in Springfield, Missouri in 1958 stating that it might be easier for Alice if she could have a washing machine. She was doing all of the laundry at 88 of the entire missionary compound on a washboard. Well, Melvin Hodges, the mission secretary at that time, asked why wasn't her district taking care of her? And then it came to their attention that because Alice went to Argentina before there was an Assemblies of God, before there were any districts, nobody was keeping an eye on this little lady to cover her needs. And so the very first offering of what became known as the Etta Calhoun Fund, which is, is an organization of women in the Assemblies of God to provide for missionary needs, they sent her a brand new 1958 washing machine paid for by those WMs. And she wrote back, and I love this. She wrote back expressing much thanks and said, you have greatly lightened the work. I've never seen anything like it. It is beautiful as well as useful. So I have put it right in front of the compound so everyone can admire its beauty. When she finally, because of health and age at age 90, returned to the United States a year before her death at 91, her travel companion said this, as I saw her few little ragged belongings, I thought, these are the earthly treasures of a missionary. But just though, as the word of God says, great is her reward in heaven. Now, many of you have heard of the Pentecostal revival that took place in Argentina in the 1980s and in the 1990s, a revival that swept that country. The leaders of that revival each wrote that their debt to, uh, to history and to Alice Wood laying the foundation for what happened in the 80s and 90s was, was an enormous debt. So here is a little woman, never married, never had children, but obeyed God's call. And God gave her a family that later grew into the millions because she had been obedient to God's call. You know, as our children need to hear about the times that we have obeyed God's call and God has been faithful.
Let me tell you next about a little lady by the name of Nellie, <coughs> who along with her husband um, were so influential in reaching the Hispanic people of the United States. You know, it was Easter of March, 1943. And I, I might point out here that one of the different things in, in our files on this particular ministry couple, as opposed to others, you will notice here that Demetrio's birth and death date, 1900-1976, but you'll also see that for some reason, Nellie has two death dates in our files. Easter, 1943, Nellie had recently undergone a hysterectomy. She had had some complications and blood loss had left her debilitated and lifeless. Many of the brothers and sisters in their church had donated blood, but the doctors operated. They were convinced that she could handle the surgery. But after surgery, even though everything seemed to be going well, the surgery incision opened. She was taken to the operating room again and the doctors fought frantically to save her life, but nothing they did helped. The doctors called in Demetrio and told him that there was not anything they could do for her. They recommended that he called their children together and bring them in. Demetrio brought their two daughters who lived out of town and they came in along with their other children. And Nellie Rader later writes that it was so emotional to see her kids cry around her bed. She could barely speak. I told them, she said, stop crying and have faith. In my daily talks with God, I asked God, give me 15 more years so that I could raise my three-year-old daughter and my other children until they were grown. Well, the brothers and sisters of the Gulf, the Gulf District of the Assemblies of God prayed and visited her for many, many days, but she did not get better. One week before Easter in her frail state, she told the nurses that on Easter morning at nine o'clock, Reverend Jose Sanchez, her pastor, would come to her room to serve her communion. The nurses looked at each other as if to say, that's impossible. They were so sure that she wouldn't live to see Resurrection Sunday. All treatment had been suspended and they were simply waiting for the inevitable to happen. On Saturday night before Easter, the inevitable happened. The children had returned back home. Only Demetrio was there in the hospital waiting for God to intervene in some way. He was seated with his head hanging down when the doctor came out and walked to Demetrio and, and said, Reverend Bazan, we have done everything we can to save your wife's life, but the Lord has taken her to her heavenly home. Demetrio cried unconsolably. Pastor, your wife is in heaven. It's a better place. Demetrio returned home where he threw himself on the bed that he shared with his wife and began to ask God to give him the strength to adjust to the new normal, to raise his little girl, to see the rest of the children brought to adulthood, to lead the ministry that they had led together. He reports, I fought with the angel of the Lord like Jacob had. I fought all night. God, give me strength. He wasn't praying at that point anymore for her healing, but simply as a brokenhearted husband. Six hours he spent in prayer. And when he finally felt a peace from the Lord and a voice that said, get up, your wife is alive. She is not dead. And suddenly, Demetrio felt that horrible grief vanish. He stood up from where he was kneeling, washed his face, and with a very still spirit, drove to the hospital to see Nellie. And when he got there, the doctors, had, having already pronounced Nellie dead, had moved her to the morgue. And when Demetrio got to the hospital, he said to the nurses, I have to see my wife. And the nurses said to him, Pastor, your wife is gone. You must accept the Lord's will. And he said, no, I feel from the Lord that she is alive. And the nurses told him only the doctor can authorize us to remove her body from the morgue. So they called the doctor who had gone home. The doctor comes back and says, Pastor Bazan, you must accept the Lord's will. But the pastor in his state simply insisted that he see his wife. So the doctor went into the morgue, 
pulled out the refrigerated body of Nelly Bazan. And when they noticed, as they pulled her out, they saw some movement under the sheet. They pulled the sheet back. Nelly Bazan set up on the gurney, said she was cold and asked for some hot tea. Now, this was at the alarm nurses ran <laughs> to tell the doctor of the extraordinary development and the pastor began to jump up and down and say it's resurrection Sunday it's resurrection Sunday and lo and behold at nine o'clock pastor Jose Ch Sanchez shows up at the hospital on Easter Sunday as previously arranged to bring communion to Nelly Bazan having no idea that she had been in the morgue for the the last several hours as he walked into her room ready to serve communion Nelly looked at the nurses and said I told you so these are the stories of God's sovereign intervention. Now, does God always answer miraculously? No, but sometimes he does. And that gives us hope and faith to continue on. And for those of us who have hoped and prayed and still stood at a cemetery at a gravesite and had to leave and begin the new normal that Demetrio Bazan was, was facing, we have found time and time again that God still sovereignly intervenes and gives us strength. We need to tell these stories to our children. Just two more stories I want to share with you. This one is a little lady that I met just a few years ago at General Council. So there we are. And she was at her 90th birthday. And we began to talk as she came by our, our booth at General Council. And she told me the story of the first church that she planted before she married. Later, she married and raised her children to serve the Lord. But when she was a young girl, she was raised in a Catholic home and she would often go to the church. And in the church on a beautiful stand was a big book. And she asked the priest what that big book was. And he said to her, that's the Bible. It's God's word. And she asked if she could read it. And he said, no, no, that's only for the, the men of God to read. But every time she went to church, she had a longing to read what that book said for herself. Well, one day she was invited to a vacation Bible school at a, at a um, evangelical work. And there was a Pentecostal connection with that vacation Bible school as churches were joining together. And one of the things that happened at that VBS was that Esther was given her very own copy of God's word, the Bible. She was so excited that she ran home to her aunt's house and read it all night long. At one point in the night, <coughs> excuse me, she went outside and looked up at the stars and asked God, if you're really real, would you show me yourself? She went back in and as she began to read again, she felt the presence of the Lord in her young little life in a way that she told me was absolutely palpable and she knew that she had been changed. When her aunt came into the room the next morning to make breakfast, she was still sitting there reading that Bible. She later went on for some Bible training and was credentialed with the Hispanic Assemblies of God. And in 1945, there was a village in Mexico that they wanted to plant a church. They sent a young man into the village, but the church, the, excuse me, the village was heavily Catholic. They did not want one of these Pentecostal people coming in. They shot the young church planter. So they sent in another young man. They shot him as well. And then the leaders put their heads together and said, who can we send in that they will not shoot this way? And they thought, well, I bet they wouldn't treat a little girl that way. And believe it or not, they called 16 year old Esther, said, we will give you a horse and some money if you will go into that village and try to start a church. So Esther, in obedience to God, takes the horse, moves into the village. She and four other friends traveled across the border as migrant workers to pick oranges in California during the day and then would travel back into Mexico in the evening where they would mix mud and water, building the bricks to build a church. 
Meanwhile, they were having Bible studies and leading other young people to the Lord while building that church by hand, making their own bricks after a day of picking oranges as migrant workers. Esther told me that at age 90, she was invited back for the anniversary of that little church, along with the four girls who helped her. That church today is going strong. It is, it is honoring to its founding pastor. And we need to tell the stories of how in obedience to God's leading, we find him so very faithful. Do you have stories like that in your life? I'll bet you do. Think hard enough, think long enough, and you'll find them. Your children and grandchildren need to hear them. One last story of God's sustaining grace. I want to tell you about a couple, Mark and Gladys Bliss, who met at Central Bible Institute and were married and called to the mission field. And they ended up opening the gospel, the Pentecostal message, into a country called Iran. They were in Iran in the 1950s and into the 60s. They were there at a time when the Shah was still ruling and there was a little more freedom, not full freedom, but there was a, certainly more freedom than what they know today under the Ayatollahs. <coughs> Mark and Gladys in 1969 were driving with another pastor, a young man that they had led to the Lord by the name of Haikov Sepian. And they were going with Hike and his young wife and, and their infant child, along with Mark and Gladys's three kids, Karen, Debbie, and, and little Mark, who was three. And they were driving to visit a, a place that Hike wanted to pastor a church. In the meantime, they came through a village that they had that both Mark and Hike had been arrested in just a few months earlier for preaching. They stopped at that village to pray that God would open up the doors. While they were there, they'd gotten out of the car. The, the uh, four grown-ups had all taken hands while the children played, and they prayed and prayed that God would open the doors. Well, the prayer meeting lasted a little longer than they intended, and by the time they got back into the car, darkness was approaching. Mark and Gladys in the, in the front seat with one of the children, and Hike and his wife and their infant and the other two children in the back seat, and they began driving toward the place. Well, Mark didn't see the tractor trailer on the side of the road with its lights out stopped in the middle of the road. And as Mark was driving and this stopped tractor was in front of him, he hit it head on. Mark, uh, all of them lost consciousness. Mark later awoke to find that all three of his children were dead. His wife unconscious, Gladys did not regain consciousness for several days. Hike and his wife also lost their infant child in that car accident. Gladys was taken uh, along with Mark, they, they were all injured. Gladys was taken to a, a field hospital where she laid on a gurney in the hallway of the hospital for three days because they thought there was no way that she would live. Finally, a military man came in, saw the American lady laying unconscious in the hallway and said, someone needs to attend to her. Mark had to have the funerals of all three of his children, Karen, Debbie, and Mark, without mom. And when Gladys finally regained consciousness, she had to hear that she was no longer anyone's mother, that Karen and Debbie and Mark had gone on to glory while she slept. This was an incredible blow for a young woman with so much love to give and now very few to give it to. Mark and Gladys continued on serving the Lord in Iran until the, the Shah was deposed. Matter of fact, they got out of of Iran just two days before the hostages were taken in 1979. Just after they had left, a neighbor later sent them a message that government officials came looking for them at their apartment. They moved to Bangladesh where they were blessed to adopt a, a little girl who had been born this, the, I believe the same year, maybe just a couple years later as the time that they had lost their children. They served the Lord faithfully in Bangladesh until they needed to retire and come home to the United States. 
Unfortunately, the little girl that they adopted did not, did not transfer well back to another culture, became involved with the drug culture and with another uh, missionary kid got into a lot of trouble. In 2016, their adopted daughter also died due to drug related issues. And in 2017, Mark died, leaving Gladys with no family, and yet, I can tell you that one of the happiest, most, most um, content women I have ever known is my next door neighbor, Gladys Bliss. This was a, we, we take her flowers on Mother's Day and it, we both have COVID. So this year we're having someone else deliver them to Gladys as she is at Maranatha Village. She's just gone there within the last week. And I want you to know that regardless of your situation today, maybe you're a mother with children who are doing well and love you. Maybe you're a woman who's never had children. Maybe you're a woman whose children are bringing you more pain than you ever thought possible. Maybe you are here and your own memories of your mother are painful. My own mother left when I was 11 years old and I was raised by a single father and then later a stepmother. God knows what we need. And I want you to think about the stories that God has given you because it is so important. There, there's an old African saying that when an old person dies, a library is burned to the ground. And that's why in Psalm, we see that God commanded our fathers and mothers that they should make his works known to their children, that the generations to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. You know, Gladys Pliss, Every holiday since I met her in 2017 at Mark's funeral, every holiday, every birthday, she goes out and buys a little something for my grandkids because there is so much love to give. And I love to listen to her tell them the stories of what God has done in their lives. You know, can I just tell you that in Yankton, South Dakota, as the Pentecostal representation of the kingdom of God there. We cannot afford to raise another generation that do not that does not know the Lord or the works that he has done for Israel. So again, as we began this, this, these stories this morning, I encourage you today, next week, maybe you need to get on the phone. Maybe you need to put on the voice recorder on your smartphone or write a letter. But it is so important that we revisit the places that God has worked in our lives, not just for our own encouragement, but for the encouragement and the teaching and the inspiration of the generation to come. Gather them around you. And I might just throw in, kids will listen to grandparents when they won't always listen to mom and dad. So sit down, get those stories told so that the generations to come, should the Lord tarry from your church, your community will continue to spread through the generations to come and God will reveal himself to your children, grandchildren and great grandchildren as the God of their fathers and mothers. You know, church, it's good to revisit the places where God has been. Now, I don't know what Pastor Spencer's plans are this morning, but I can tell you this. There is something about revisiting the altars that God has put in our lives. And so I encourage you this morning to do so on Mother's Day. Can I just pray for you? Lord, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for all that you have done. I thank you for the blessings of the women of 
yanked at assemblies of God and for the men who support them and open doors for them. And Lord, I just pray a special anointing on this church as they are in a new era and a new time with a new pastor and new excitement that you would, through the power of the Holy Spirit, pour yourself out on this congregation, on their children, on their grandchildren, and all the generations to come, so that however long you tarry, Yankton, South Dakota, will have a representation of a spirit-filled kingdom right there in the middle of what you are doing. And I thank you, Lord, that you hear our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.